Welcome to Brookings India. My name is Dhruva Jayashankar. I think I know most of you already. I'm a fellow for foreign policy here at Brookings India. Uh, and it's my pleasure here to uh, be moderating this conversation this afternoon uh, on a world in flux, uh, the Atlantic community, West Asia, and the Indo-Pacific. Uh, this is really an occasion to have a conversation with two people who are uh, colleagues and, and, uh, at the Brookings Institute and leaders at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. Uh, to my uh, left, my, uh, my immediate left, is uh, Strobe Talbot, who has been president of the Brookings Institution for the last 15 years. He uh, started, he was a journalist at Times, uh, Time Magazine, uh, then was Deputy Secretary of State uh, in the Clinton administration, uh, during which time he became almost a household name here in India uh, for leading uh, the talks with Jaswan Singh after the 1998 nuclear tests. Um, he has, a, 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 I mean, not just uh, ex experience in uh, dealing with India, but really in dealing with many uh, troubled hotspots around the world. Uh, and again, had much of his career start uh, focused on uh, the Soviet Union, Russia, and, and Europe. Uh, to my right I is uh, the gentleman who will be succeeding uh, uh, Strobe Talbot as president of the Brookings Institution in just a few weeks' time, uh, General John Allen, who spent uh, 40 years in the U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, amongst other things, he was the deputy commander of the U.S. Central Command and uh, was the commander of U.S. forces uh, in, uh, and the international forces uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, for uh, for a few years uh, before retiring. He subsequently went on to a career as a diplomat. Uh, he served uh, as a diplomat in uh, the Middle East peace talks in uh, between Israel, Palestine, and Jordan, uh, and uh, then was uh, leading uh, the diplomatic efforts, uh, was, was, was President Obama's uh, appointee to lead the diplomatic efforts against the uh, Islamic State, uh, efforts against the Islamic State. Uh, he will be succeeding, as I said, uh, as the president of the Brookings Institution. Um, so what I thought I'd do is I, we would have a conversation here um, with uh, the, the two of them, and I would start off by just asking them a few questions, uh, after which we will very soon bring all of you into the conversation and hopefully give you an opportunity to ask them questions about uh, developments around the world. Um, Strobe, let me start with you. Um, the first uh, area we, uh, you know, in, in, in at least in the title of this uh, event, uh, is about the Atlantic community. Um, and uh, I think for many years, uh, at least for some generations of the uh, people in the United States, the Atlantic community was in some ways an article of faith. Um, but today, uh, things are a little bit different. We have uh, uh, populist movements in Western Europe. Uh, we have concerns about uh, uh, sort of, uh, relations between the West and Russia, uh, which have sharply deteriorated since 2014. Um, and we have uh, a president in the United States who is uh, famously and vocally skeptical uh, of the notion of U.S. alliance commitments, including in Europe. Um, so I guess a question to start off is, does the Atlantic community exist in, in, in any way today, and, and does it have much of a future? It, pardon? Fortunately, it still exists. <coughs> Unfortunately, it's not there. Um, actually, yeah. I'll hold this in front of my, my mouth here. <coughs> I kind of see it as a seesaw. Uh, back in the 1980s and the early 1990s, uh, the seesaw looked like this. Russia, the USSR was down. Uh, and we know what that meant. It meant that the system fell apart, the state disintegrated, and that uh, had a profound influence on the western uh, part of the seesaw because all of a sudden the great threat that brought about NATO and NATO helped bring about the EU was gone. Uh, the American president at the time, George H.W. Bush, said we now have a Europe that will be whole and free uh, and that sort of shot the West up almost to euphoria. So here we are about uh, quarter of a century later, and the seesaw 
has done this. And I would think that in some ways, um, it wasn't just the new and authoritarian government and leader of the, uh, of the Russian Federation that brought this about. It was in part because where in the 80s uh, the West was all about integration, now the West was about disintegration, including the, the, the disintegration of individual states. Uh, we're seeing that in the headlines today about the possibility of uh, Catalan secession from Spain and uh, Brexit is not only something that is going to take or may take, most people think will take, uh, the UK out of uh, the European Union, but it could also strain the UK itself so that the UK may end up being not such a, a uh, united uh, kingdom. Uh, and that has given uh, Putin and Putinism a real shot in the arm. Uh, and, th and under Putin, Russia is not only uh, reintegrating uh, itself, but it is also expanding uh, using, let's say, the geopolitical instruments of hard power of the early part of the 20th century, which is uh, bad news. I'll stop with just uh, one uh, more hopeful note. Uh, the, all the, these d dynamics that I'm describing are well, um, uh, are, are very much in the minds of, let's call them, responsible and influential leaders in Europe. Um, at, but as uh, Druva suggested, there are a lot of concerns in Europe, particularly in, among our allies, in or, our America's allies in Europe. Uh, there is concern whether the current president of the United States is committed to that 70-year-old legacy that Druva mentioned at the very outset. Just a quick follow-up. Um, there is a view, you know, India has an old and deep relationship with Russia. Um, when the crisis broke, the, the Ukraine crisis broke in 2014, uh, there was a view here, and there still is a view here, uh, that in part, uh, whatever the means were that, whatever the merits of the means that were used by, by Russia in, in the annexation of Crimea, that at least Europe and the US were partly to blame for shifting the goalposts on expansion um, in a way that provoked Russia to, to respond. Do you think, I mean, th this is a view that's been articulated in the US by John Mearsheimer and others as well. Do, do you give that view any credence or what, what, what is it? Well, one of these days I will maybe find a way of agreeing with John Mearsheimer, but uh, l let's leave him uh, aside. Uh, I think the, uh, the, the charge that is part of the Russian narrative is simply false. Uh, there was never any uh, changing of the, uh, or moving of the, of, the, uh, of the goalposts. Back in the 90s, the uh, United States, uh, with a lot of support, from Germany in particular, and we could come back on that uh, if, if we wanted to in the conversation, uh, felt that it was very important that NATO uh, move east. But it would be a new NATO. In fact, it would be interesting to hear uh, John's uh, perspective of that um, because uh, it, NATO is, of course, a security and military uh, part of the Western uh, community, which is based on values, democracy, open society, and that kind of thing. Had we not uh, allowed the, um, the member states of what was then a defunct Warsaw Pact 
if we had left them in a kind of a strategic uh, vacuum, it would be very likely that a number of those countries would have uh, been very frightened that Russia might turn bad someday, uh, which would have been prescient. Uh, and they would also go back to squabbles among themselves, including territorial squ uh, squabbles. Whereas if you brought them in to a new NATO, which by the way, never, uh, at least in the Clinton administration, never said that uh, Russia itself would be exempt from NATO. It could be, in the, it would be a long time in the future. But it was no longer a alliance in those days uh, to contain R Russia. It was to maintain stability and allow for the the uh, uh, the growth of democracy in countries that had not had it for a long time. And very importantly, and this is one reason why uh, Germany, in particular, uh, wanted to see the expansion of NATO, that those co countries. As, no, as NATO members would be accepted into the European Union. Uh, final quick question with a Twitter, a Twitter answer, 140 character answer. G knowing what we know now, um, and knowing that you did a lot for the cause of disarmament, did Ukraine make a mistake by giving up nuclear weapons at the end of the Cold War? Absolutely no. Now that gives me a couple more characters. Uh, if the Ukrainians uh, refused to let go of their uh, nuclear weapons, that would not have stopped the Russian Federation from doing what it did uh, after the Sochi Olympics. They would, Putin would probably have done it uh, long before because he has, Russia had uh, a lot of, let's say, assets that would make uh, those uh, weapons um, probably uh, unusable for the Ukrainian government. Thank you very much. Let's pivot a little bit to the South um, and uh, to uh, the Middle East, what we in India call West Asia. Um, General Allen, you've, you've served uh, a long time there. You've come to know the region very well. Um, but we find ourselves in uh, a, a situation now where the Middle East is perhaps in more disarray uh, than at least any time in the, in the past 20, 30 years at the very least, uh, with num a number of simultaneous conflicts, um, a number of fragile states. Um, some of that blame for the state of the Middle East is placed uh, in the region on the United States and its involvement there. Um, as somebody who's been involved as a military commander there, what do you think the U.S. can do, if anything, to help stabilize the Middle East? Well, the, the, uh, well first let me uh, make the comment that it's really wonderful to be here with Brookings India. Uh, it is uh, a marvelous organization that's doing terrific work. Uh, and it is its work that in Washington we're proud to be a partner uh, with you in, in undertaking. So you know, thank you for the invitation to, to be here, and thank you for the opportunity to do this this afternoon. Uh, as with anything, um, a topic this complex defies uh, a Twitter answer. Uh, it defies almost any answer. Uh, but I'll, I'll simply say a couple of things. I've been in and out of the Middle East for uh, 25 years or so, uh, a lot of time in the last few years. and. There, you have to understand several things that are at work there. Uh, and almost no external powers policy with respect to the Middle East has been successful. Uh, and in some cases, some of those policies have been spectacular failures. Uh, but let's, let's just sort of diagnose what the problem has been. Um, almost anyone who observes uh, the Middle East today or Middle East crises today will make a mistake if perhaps the first stopping point or the first membrane that they're passing through isn't the Cold War that has emerged between the Saudi-led Sunni nations and the Iranian or Persian-led Shia elements. Uh, the weaponization of the differences of the confessions within Islam uh, 
have created an enormous dynamic in the region and almost any problem that you find there, <clears throat> if you scratch at it just for a moment, you'll discover that there is some element of that Cold War at work in the process. But that's not it. That's not only it. Um, 100 years after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, which is roughly where we are today, uh, and in the aftermath of the Arab Spring, which revealed for us, I think, in ways that we had not anticipated, structural weakness across the systems of governance of North Africa and the Middle East, the traditional Middle East, and in, in other areas. Uh, what, we've, what we have found is that there, have, there were enormous structural weaknesses in the, in the aftermath of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire because systems of governance never really were put into place in the manner that supported the populations at large. And if you look back at this, almost none of the people in the Middle East would ever have chosen the borders that were imposed on them by outside colonial powers in the aftermath of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the, <clears throat> and the Versailles Treaty and the, the mandatory period, the period of mandate where much of the Middle East was turned over to European powers who, who by the way, couldn't do any better than the Ottomans uh, in, uh, in uh, controlling the region. They would never have drawn those borders that way. Sykes-Picot comes to mind instantly. They would probably not have selected the leadership that would ultimately be imposed on them by outside powers. Um, and they would probably have chosen other systems of governance uh, that was more consistent with their traditions, their own histories, their tribal relations, their faith, uh, in this case, uh, the, their particular confession within the faith of Islam. So we had multiple uh, opposing force vectors, if you will, in the, in the aftermath of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the end of World War I, and those continued to simmer, but they were never under any real uh, pressure from within. They might have been pressured from without in the period of the Arab-Israeli wars, but what happened uh, in late uh, December of 2010 and early 2011 was the the uprising of the of the uh, the youthful element of one country after another, utterly despairing of any future, either in a dictatorial regime or in an unresponsive tribal regime. And I was at the Central Command at the time when Mohammed uh, Bouazizi in Tunis set fire to himself. It literally threw the match onto the region, and we watched the region burn itself down from one end to the other. And we, we listened to Al-Qaeda uh, seeking to find justification for their view of Salafi jihadi extremism in what was happening. And frankly, Al-Qaeda tried to sprint out ahead to take credit for this, when in fact this was a massive failure of Arab governance, it was a massive failure of societal support, and it was the human condition which revolted in the region. And it revolted uh, for good reasons that were in many respects local, but in many cases were similar. But it was, and this is a key point, it was really accelerated in ways we've never seen before by social media. And one after another, as groups of young, uh, Arabs or Berbers or North Africans across the region saw what was happening in adjacent countries by virtue of Twitter or Instagram or YouTube, it just exploded. So today we have several civil wars, uh, and I won't take you through them because everybody's familiar with the agony, uh, but today we have several civil wars, the Syrian civil war being the most symbolic of how bad this can be. Uh, where the preponderance of the population in Syria is displaced. It has destabilized, in many respects, the frontline states, Turkey, Jordan, uh, Lebanon, and to some extent Egypt. But now to Strobe's point, because there's a linkage here, the enormous refugee flows into Europe have in fact destabilized European politics as well. Uh, this, this influx of a new uh, quality of individual, and I don't say quality in the context of good, bad, or different, but a different element of society into Europe was responded to often 
with right-wing politics and nativist politics polarizing the political environment, aided, by the way, by a highly sophisticated Russian influence operation to destabilize confidence in democratic institutions within Europe. And this is where we, we see the intersection of what's happened in the Middle East with what's happening in Europe today and how if we don't get a handle on this, it's only going to get worse. And I, the, the most recent conflict in the Middle East, of course, is between Qatar on one side and the so-called quartet on the other, which is Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, Bahrain, and Egypt. And, and on any given day, you can take sides, one side or the other, with the grievances of the two, two elements. But I think the outcome of this is pretty clear. We're, we're beginning to see some exhaustion creeping into our friends in the region, and America has friends on both sides of the conflict. We're seeing the Qataris perhaps moving more closely into the orbit of Iran, although they're very clearly an Arab state, and we have very close relations with them, but that's not an outcome that we want to see. We see the reintroduction of Turkish influence into the region which is not necessarily something that the Arabs want to see themselves, and the potential for Turkey and Iran to find common interest and common purpose in the Gulf. And I think, uh, worst of all, I think the GCC may be permanently wounded in this process. So what do we do about it? Well, we, we need in the United States to have a policy. <laughs> Any policy would be good, um, but a policy soon which, puts, which gives our precious friends in the region, which gives our European partners in the region, which gives our allies in the region, which gives them some context then for us to take community action as the community of nations to deal with this. In the end, most of the problems in the Middle East, apart from the, con the weaponization of the confessional differences between Islam, within Islam, are human problems. And the causal factors associated with this is what we have to address. Uh, an absence of access to education, an absence of a participatory government, an absence of a functioning judiciary, no equal rights for women, and, and in many cases, uh, zero economic prospects for many of the young men and women of the Middle East. And as a direct result of that, since we can't seem to come together as a community of nations, and certainly most of these nations can't do it for themselves, the long-term effect is a massive, widespread radicalization of tens of millions of young men and women. And that radicalization creates instability within countries, but pushes them into the arms of extremists, and pretty soon they're strapping on suicide vests. So my view would be we have to swim upstream in this crisis. We have to swim upstream and identify the causal factors that create such distress at the human level and begin as a community of nations to work with the states in the Middle East to begin to solve these problems. And it's a, it's a very complicated issue. And it didn't start last Tuesday, and we're not going to solve it next Tuesday. This is a generational issue. We've got to take some action in the short term at the near horizon to defend ourselves and to keep more states from going over the edge. And then perhaps 10 to 15 years out in a concerted effort by the community of nations to work uh, within countries to strengthen institutions of governance and finance and education, et cetera, to stabilize the population. And then at the deep horizon, a whole generation out, just constantly be engaged with the countries of the, of the region to stabilize them over the long term, helping them to develop institutions of governance and uh, to provide the kinds of services to the, uh, to the populations that can reduce the radicalization. We're always going to find terrorists. We are always going to find extremists. But we can do something about the causal factors of radicalization. And we'll never solve all of them, but we can certainly get at many of them if we think about this in a systematic way. This is the role that the United States can play is to help to organize that process. Oh, one more question to you. I mean, just pivoting further east uh, to the Indo-Pacific, to the region that, that we are in. Um, in some ways, there's a great deal of concern about uh, the growing militarization in the region. We've been seeing a number of uh, standoffs uh, of late, a number of uh, territorial disputes that have been flaring up. Um, at the same time, I think it's, it's important to keep in mind that we haven't really seen a major conflict in, in this part of the world for, for some time now, for, for over a generation, uh, possibly the China-Vietnam War being the last major uh, conflict in the region. Um, 
but the nature of warfare is changing. Um, and could you perhaps talk a little bit about some of the changes that are taking place in the military domain, uh, in terms of military technologies, that might upset this, ba this uh, very fragile balance that, that, that really has uh, marked this world? Yeah, a couple of things I'll say on, on this, and everybody in Europe probably is exhausted by now. Um, there, there is, in military theory, uh, the concept of the nature of war versus the character of war. And the nature of war is the human dimension of conflict. And the human dimension which has the capacity to understand the geostrategic environment in which it operates, but also to understand the other aspect, the character of war, which is typically about the technology associated with war. And when the nature of war and the character of war are in sync, then your capabilities are relatively well known and you can actually create coherent military strategies. But when they get out of sync, you find the results, uh, a perfect example would be when uh, certain leading German uh, military officers in the interwar years recognized that a fast moving armored vehicle coupled with a new innovation called the radio and supported from the air by radio by uh, flying artillery, the Stuka, created in integration a capability of warfare no one could ever have imagined on the other side. And it only was integrating technology that existed, the Blitzkrieg. And in the United States case, the Japanese were very attentive to developments uh, at the beginning of World War II and saw the German, or excuse me, saw the British attack of the Italian fleet in Toronto. The swordfish uh, biplanes coming off of a British carrier dropping torpedoes and taking out much of the Italian fleet while the United States was engaged in a, a substantial debate on whether we should have more battleships or more carriers. The Japanese ended that debate for us by on the 7th of December because the American nature of war had not kept up with the integrative capabilities of the technology of war and finally the Japanese taught us that problem. We are in a new situation like that today. Uh, which is that the Russian capacity to wage hybrid war, uh, which, by the way, is underway right now, as far as I'm concerned, uh, in the eastern portion of NATO and Central Europe, which is a highly sophisticated influence operation which seeks to sow uh, widespread cynicism and uh, concern over systems of government and democratic principles, has really undermined the confidence of populations within states and states within the EU and states within NATO. Hybrid warfare. And it comes in many different forms and it relies in many respects on cyber operations. But there's a new form of warfare that really worries me. And it is the advent of artificial intelligence in high speed computing. Uh, and it's known as hyper war. And where in hybrid war, you may encounter the requirement to make a decision uh, in weeks, days, and hours. In hyper war, when we find ourselves with command and control systems that ingest petabytes of information and can, and can be programmed for autonomous decision making. And then with autonomous systems capable of target engagement and target destruction, being slaved to those master command and control systems, which can be done. Uh, we find that decision making in a hyper war environment occurs in hours, minutes, or less than seconds. And so we, we find ourselves now confronting uh, issues associated with the kinds of war, which is very difficult to detect at the hy hybrid war level, and essential that you compete at the hyper war level. And we, we don't really see and we haven't seen, and the U.S. is engaging on this now, I think, uh, the capacity to create a comprehensive policy and comprehensive strategy that embraces all of it. I think the key point is, often the issue is, especially today, is less about innovation in war than it is about integration of existing systems. And just as brilliant strategists and technicians integrated something that ended up looking like Blitzkrieg with all of its effects, we're going to find some brilliant strategists and scientists integrating the capabilities of artificial intelligence with existing systems and developing future systems 
that will lead into a decision action loop that will be measured routinely in less than seconds. Uh, and this is what we're facing. Now, how much of that we embrace, uh, how much of that we are going to leave to others, for example, our friends of the Chinese, and I'm not proposing necessarily that they're moving towards a hyperwar capability, but they've just committed $150 billion into AI research. You know, AI is going to change the world in many respects, um, apart from all of the human, economic, governmental dimensions of artificial intelligence being embraced into the 21st century. It's going to change warfare. And the side that invests in that now <clears throat> and begins the process of, of formal strategic review and, and development of strategy will be the side that can prevent itself from being surprised. One final uh, I, I do want to open it up to people very quickly, but just uh, you mentioned hybrid warfare um, and the experiences of NATO and uh, Ukraine in, in, in Europe. Um, to when we sitting in India, when we read about these developments, it actually sounds very familiar. Um, ambiguity, the use of non-state actors, information warfare. Um, in many ways, India has been dealing with a form of hybrid warfare for 70 years. Um, and uh, since you were commander in Afghanistan um, and was directly involved in, in, in dealing with some of the same uh, groups, uh, same non-state actors. Um, do you see any commonality and, and potential for lessons learned between the experience of what you're seeing in Eastern Europe and, and what we've been seeing in South Asia? Well, I, I see that there are lessons learned. I think what I become more concerned about is that uh, the lessons learned are being shared between and among the groups. I mean, there are lessons that we ought to be learning. One of the concerns that I have, for example, is as we have emerged in the United States after 16, now 17 years of constant conflict, I was commandant of midshipman at the Naval Academy on the day that 9-11 occurred, um, and 15, 16 years later, I'm promoting to lieutenant commander and major the midshipman that I was uh, educating at the Naval Academy. Those young officers have never known a time when we were not at war in the United States. I mean, they just think my classmate here, Gary Stark, he and I were in the same company together at the Naval Academy right after the American Civil War. And, uh, <laughs> and our worldview was colored by the Cold War. And most of us didn't go to war except very, very few of us for most of our careers. These kids have been at war in multiple theaters or been in very stressful presence operations the whole time that they have been in the service. Um, so I think that the, the, uh, the challenge that I worry about today is as we have emerged from, from large-scale conflict and as we attempt to embrace the traditional missions of the Marine Corps and the Navy, the traditional missions of the Army and the Air Force, we've, we have got to, it's an essential aspect of our post-war or post-conflict era, we have got to remember our obligations not to forget the lessons that we learned after over 15 years of, of insurgency and counter-terror operations. And one of my biggest concerns today is that as Daesh, the Islamic State, is defeated physically, it will become a provincial force. It will spread out in small groups uh, into provinces, what they called walayats, overseas provinces, into North Africa, into the Sinai, into Southern Arabian Peninsula, into the Caucasus, which continues to make it more difficult for the Russians to govern, into this place called the Khorasan, which is a swath of the ancient Islamic map of Afghanistan and Pakistan, into Bangladesh, into Southeast Asia. I worry about that. And the other piece I worry about is the, the growing symbiotic relationship between these terror networks and highly sophisticated transnational criminal networks. So we can't forget these lessons as we retool and rearm ourselves in the United States to be ready to answer the call in the context of our national security strategy. We cannot uh, neglect these lessons in the preparation of our young officers and soldiers to be ready in the event that a hybrid type warfare breaks out as opposed to a high-end hyper warfare scenario. Thank you. Uh, let's open this up to a few questions. And what I would suggest is we take a few people at a time. Uh, you're welcome to provide a comment or a question, but please keep it to one if, if everybody could do that, just to maximize that. So let's start. Uh, Ambassador Yogan Kumar, Manoj Joshi. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's most fascinating uh, discussion. 
Uh, right. Uh, my name is Yogesh Kumar. I'm former ambassador. In fact, uh, uh, I used to be ambassador in Tajikistan when uh, Operation Enduring Freedom was launched. So I had an opportunity to watch it from close quarters, so to say. I think uh, in terms of the lessons learned, uh, post-Cold War and all this remaking of the Middle Eastern map, my question actually is that, of course, I mean, the U.S. has overwhelming uh, military power capability, capability to make states. What lessons have been learned at the military level, the political level, or the diplomatic level, as to why the U.S. was not able to deploy this overwhelming military force to make sure that the transition, which was the ultimate objective, the political transformation, the transition, actually led to stability rather than instability. I mean, Afghanistan uh, today is much more unstable than it was after the operation Enduring Freedom. The operation actually ended in November. So I'm just wondering, what conclusions can be drawn at this level? Sure, you know, the, this, this is not hard for me, frankly, and that is uh, the U.S. has enormous capacity to defeat virtually any military on the planet in decisive military operations. That's not where the challenge comes. The challenge comes in the post-decisive period of operations, which is primarily uh, the establishment of a political outcome and an economic outcome than necessarily a military outcome. So when you when you win the war, it's easy to lose the peace. And that's been our problem. When you pull out on the 31st of December 2011, several years before we really should have departed Iraq, we shouldn't be surprised that we're back fighting in Iraq again. When you pull out on the 31st of December 2014, which was the end of Enduring Freedom, uh, my mission was to convert the theater, convert the theater so the Afghans were in the lead, we hadn't intended for the Afghans to go into the lead until well into 2013. Because of the decision by NATO to pull out on the four, uh, 31st December 2014, I had to push the Afghans, the entire army, into the lead long before they were ready, a full year and a half early. At the same time, I'm drawing down my forces from 150,000 to 9,500 and moving from 835 bases to 12 bases. You, the, the amount of turbulence associated with all of that means it's going to be very difficult for you ultimately to win the peace. Winning the peace is a political, military, diplomatic, and primarily economic show. And if you don't put the resources into that, we just, we just can't afford, we can't permit ourselves to be surprised at the outcome. That's the lesson learned from my perspective. And if we're not prepared to engage in high tempo, decisive operations without a comprehensive, what we call phase four, without a comprehensive phase four which is a long-term military presence, which, which uh, underwrites, underwrites the development of political capacity and, very importantly, economic stability. If we're not prepared to put that kind of investment into phase four, we better be very careful about going into phase three, as far as I'm concerned. And here's a couple of examples. We're still, there's 28,000 American troops still in Korea. At the end of the Korean War, that country was destroyed. And it took a long-term military presence to help the Koreans get on their feet. And the Korean government was relatively corrupt for a very long time, and its economy took a long time to come online. Today, look what we have. And they've had some democratic problems with their democratic institutions recently, but they got through it. And their economy is one of the most powerful on the planet. Why? Because we stuck with them. The phase four piece of this is, the, in my mind, the decisive aspect of military operations. Well, all of Europe, all of Europe. So I think that, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Uh, I have a question uh, for Strobe. Uh, to start with, what will be the influence of Russian demographics and the fact that the economy is limited to uh, just one major product, which is petroleum products? So what's going to be, the, you know, the, what you described, uh, Russia going up, so is it going to, just stay there because it seems to be a somewhat delicate perch with their demography. And a question to General Allen, uh, since you were in Central Command and you described what's happening in the Middle East, in the Persian Gulf region, why is it that India does not figure in American, uh, um, you know, we have a lot of India-American uh, ties, but those ties end at Diego Garcia. That's the limit of the US Pacific Command. For some reason, all these years, and I think Strobe can also maybe provide an answer, uh, 
why is it that the United States and India don't have a conversation on this region, which you know is far more important for us than it's for you? You know, we have see, seventy percent of our oil comes from there. Seven million of our citizen <coughs> citizens work there. You know, just a week's disruption of the oil creates chaos in this country. But why is it that India and the US are simply not looking at each other and have never looked at each other uh, in this area? Why don't we take a few more questions? So, uh, Mr. Goel and then uh, General Banerjee. So, uh, thank you. Uh, Suresh Goel, retired ambassador. Uh, my question basically relates to the recent developments in West Asia. Uh, now, we, we see very strange things happening, up there. Not, not really strange, but they have been happening there even before President Trump took over, and President Trump probably will have to now uh, see how to recover the US position there. And I think you understand what I'm talking about. Suddenly you see that uh, there is this Turkey-Iraq alliance fighting the Kurds. Iran, Iraq says no to the USA when the USA asks Iraq to throw out the Iranian militia. They depend on the Iranian militia to fight the Kurds. So you have, Russia is coming in, in a big way really, in the region. So you see the sudden geopolitics of the region changing. Uh, I would like to have your take on where it is all leading up to. General Banerjee? <coughs> General Dipank Banerjee, formerly from the Institute of Peace and Conflict Studies, which was also a partner of the Brookings Institution for some years, a few years ago, not too long ago. What a fascinating presentation regarding the nature and uh, character of war. This is the most significant challenge confronting the world as of now, there's no doubt. And this is one issue which has not uh, really been addressed. We have just begun to understand, including in India, the nature of hybrid war, what it characterizes and what it symbolizes, and the capabilities of dealing with it. But the whole question of hyperwar is an area that is still up in the open. I think enormous amount of research and thinking will have to go behind this. I hope it's not only limited to the militaries. Big question that emerges is where is the next good area likely to come from? The originator of the Blitzkrieg in the Second World War. My suspicion is that it's likely to come more from Central Asian territory from the heartland of China rather than Russia. Soviet Union, Russia, of course, is past, is gone. It's history, really. I do not quite understand the continued obsession with the Russian military power that it continues in the West, including in America. I find it difficult to understand Russia's continued relevance in the military strategic sphere in the shaping of global order in the immediate coming era. It's going to be coming from different directions and perhaps, as I said, uh, the next good area is likely to come from there. And so therefore, how do you see this emerging? And what measures could the rest of the world think about, talk about, do to deal with these challenges? <coughs> Why don't you take uh, the, the, the couple of questions on Russia, um, and uh, you know, which is uh, um, uh, given Russian demographics, dependence on oil, and and you know why why is are we giving it too much credence? I mean, the Russian economy is now half of India's economy. Um, are we giving it too much credence as a, a a global power? And then perhaps if you could take the questions on 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 the Middle East and and uh, CENTCOM India cooperation. I think the way you pose the question uh, makes it easy to provide an answer, and. Druva has uh, already started to do that. Uh, Russia is, of course, even uh, shorn of the other 14 constituent republics of the USSR, is by far the largest territorial state on the planet. Uh, but, and it, is, and it has um, not only uh, a history but a future of very, uh, both qualitative and quantitative military power, not to mention uh, being a superpower in terms of its nuclear weapons. Uh, that is, for somebody like Putin, the good news. I'm not sure to what degree he understands the bad news. 
The bad news is that Russia, going back to uh, many failed reforms during the Soviet period, could never figure out a way to make that country a modern and normal state, particularly uh, in the field of, well, democracy, which the, of which there was none uh, until the very late 80s and into the 90s, but also in the economy. And you put it very well. Russia is totally re uh, reliant on things that you can pump or dig out of the ground. Uh, they have virtually no sophisticated um, service industry. Uh, they don't have a manufacturing base that uh, can service the, the, the Russian people, not to mention uh, export. And then, and this is part of what I think is going to be a potentially fatal legacy that Mr. Putin is going to leave to his successors. Um, and uh, here got, I get to the dem demography. Uh, the, Russian, the Russian population is somewhere in the, ne in the re realm of uh, 75 to 80 percent Slavic. That part of the, po of the uh, population is, uh, has ne negative birth rates. There is another part of the population that is historically or culturally uh, uh, Muslim, not necessarily going to the mosque uh, uh, every day, but uh, a different an ethnicity. And that part of the population uh, is uh, booming. Uh, and since there is a high degree of uh, atavistic nativism in Russia's new ideology, which has basically taken the place of uh, Marxism-Leninism, uh, that is a loser. Uh, if I were the president of Russia, I'd much rather be a senior scholar at the Brookings Institution, by the way, <laughs> uh, I would go to the Kremlin, my office in the Kremlin, and I would have a huge, or as our president would say, huge map uh, on the wall of my country. And I would say, where is the threat coming from? Uh, the least threatening part, point of the compass would be the West. The, the more, well, and you, I guess you could say the North isn't much of a problem either, uh, but uh, it, it, it may be if, if, if the uh, polar ice cap becomes the polar sea, that's a different issue. The, 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 there are two big threats. One is from the South, from uh, extreme um, Islam, uh, and uh, because, going back to something that, that John said, uh, Russia has basically picked a side in the Cold War between the Sunnis and the Shia. They have, they have decided to put their bets on the Shia. But most of the Russian uh, Islamic people are Sunnis, and we're already seeing uh, fighters in Syria and, and Afghanistan and places like that going back into uh, the Caucasus of southern Russia. But the big, um, I would say the ultimate geopolitical threat to Russia is China. Because when I, as, as the president of Russia, uh, I would look at the demographic part of the map and see that our, my, my eastern provinces, going all the way out to the Pacific, are rich with resources and poor with people. And that part of the country sits cheap vibe jowl on the most populous uh, country in the world. Soon, uh, when is it going to be the second most? <laughs>
soon enough. Uh, and that, but that country needs resources and needs land. And that is a, uh, a recipe for big trouble for Russia down the road. And I cannot understand why they, well, I guess I do understand why Putin is cuddling up to Russia. He's getting his, um, uh, he's getting whipped in every negotiation he has, but I think he just wants to have a anchor to windward now that his relations with the West have gone bad. Sure. <laughs> Buckle up. Um, India and the U.S. Uh, th there's no logical reason why we're not talking. And we should have been talking years ago. And I, I believe that there, there's, it's not a matter of blame, but it's, it's, a, it's a matter of our respective political cultures, I think, left over from the Cold War. Uh, and India's fierce independence and fierce sense of, of itself in the world uh, that we have not capitalized on the things that we can find in common between our two countries. Um, it's a matter of irony to me that the United States Fifth Fleet uh, has a task force which patrols the region of the uh, northern in Indian Ocean uh, and was uh, instrumental ultimately in uh, dealing with the piracy that was emanating out of East Africa. Um, that that task force was on a couple of occasions led by the Pakistani Navy. Yet the Indian Navy was not didn't figure at all in this process. And I think we've missed an opportunity here, but it's not too late. Given the numbers of Indians who are actually in the region, and in some cases outnumber the indigenous populations of some of the countries, uh, it seems to me that without a coherent cooperative partnership, partnership is the key word, two sovereign nations working together, uh, without that cooperative partnership, looking out for the interests, potential interests of Indian citizens, given the volatility of the region, India's options are gonna be very few in a major shooting crisis. And it, it just seems to me that we are at a, at a point in the US and Indian history where we ought to be talking about these kinds of things routinely. And I think the Trump government, as it has evolved over the last year, has had a, a pretty consistent line where you might not find one on almost anything else, a pretty consistent line on India, a favorable line on India. Now, we don't have a coherent policy yet, but what you hear the Secretary of State say is, is I think, encouraging. What you hear the Secretary of Defense say is encouraging. What you hear the <coughs> um, National Security Advisor say is encouraging, and the President seems to be quite taken with the potential for a deepened strategic relationship with India. There's logic there. Years ago, uh, I, was, I was responsible for East Asia policy in the Department of Defense. And I remember one of, the, one of the nations with whom we were dealing on a regular basis asked us the question, would you all, how would you all feel if we approached India to deepen our relationship with India? And our response was, what's taken you so long to ask that question? There are so much, in my mind, there is so much that we can find in common, and those areas that are not in common, we can certainly talk about them to figure out where we can go in their relationship, that it's, it's the logic of having a relationship between India and the Central Command, or India and the United States in the solution to some of the most difficult problems in the Middle East, to me, is completely logical. And it's not too late to have that conversation begin. And I think under this administration, we have the platform for that conversation to begin. So I, I agree with that. But what I, what I would hate to see is that because we don't have that conversation, India's options in a crisis where India's citizens need to be protected in a, in a shooting conflict where no one out there can do it for them except India, your options are going to be very few. And I'd hate to see that, frankly. Um, Iraq. Um, it's obviously very complex. The, the Turks, in fact, have been, as you know, supporters of the 
Kurdistan regional government in Iraq. And the U.S. policy with regard to Iraq is one of our desire ultimately to see the restoration of the sovereignty of Iraq, which includes the KRG, the Sunni West, and the Shia South. We, we adhere to that. Although the Prime Minister in Iraq, Hyder al-Abadi, has always said he wants to see increased what he called functional federalism. In particular, have seen the Sunni provinces exercise more authority over Sunnis. Um, but what he didn't want to see was the KRG hive off into outer space. Um, so the, the Turks' interest with respect to the Kurds is to keep them under control in some form or another. Uh, and I had the honor of negotiating the base agreement with the Turks that permitted us to relocate our strike assets into southern Turkey. Um, and right after we negotiated that, and we began to relocate our forces into southern Turkey to strike the Islamic State, the first assassinations by the PKK, the People's Workers' Party of the Kurdish uh, elements within Turkey, went to work on the Turks. The Turks responded, and pretty quick the, the fight inside Turkey occurred. We in northern Syria, our special operators, supported the Syrian Kurds, the PYD. Turks in their mind, make no distinction between the PKK and the PYD. We have a different view. It was the PYD and, and its armed wing, the YPG, sorry for the alphabet here, <laughs> the YPG, which organized the forces that just liberated Raqqa with American special operators and is putting the stake through the heart of the Islamic State. But this has been a real source of tension between the United States and Turkey. Now, the referendum for the KRG uh, I think most Americans believe that at some point in the future, the Kurdish entity called the KRG would in fact become independent. But our view was not now, not now. So they have the referendum. Uh, the question isn't whether they're going to ultimately be free or not. The question is when they will be free. Uh, and so the, the Turks are deeply concerned as as Strobe talked about Catalan and other states that are looking to increase uh, the numbers of microstates around the world, these microstates don't necessarily help regional stability. They're often indefensible. They, they have economies that are tied in many different directions. And I think Turkey's concern about the KRG is that if it hives off as a microstate, the chances are it could become a platform for terrorism in the region. Now, I don't think Masoud Barzani is going to permit that to happen, frankly. But you, you just don't know. Now, um, someone mentioned that the Shia or the Iraqi government, uh, when we said, let's get rid of the Shia militias in the north, Abadi has always said he was going to do away with those. He was going to demobilize some and absorb the rest. But he, his army wasn't ready to take back Mosul and to liberate the north of Iraq without what's known as the Hashtashabi, or the patriotic militia, who responded to Ali al-Sistani. They're not Iranian necessarily, but they really responded to the fatwa from Ali al-Sistani, which said, come help Iraq defend itself from the Islamic State. And those elements in the north, could, we could not have liber liberated Mosul without those elements helping to control ground around Mosul. Now Mosul is liberated. Hyder al-Abadi needs to adhere to his original commitment, which is demobilize the forces. Daesh is defeated in Iraq now. It is defeated. Demobilize the forces and absorb the rest. Um, I'm not sure I'm getting to where you wanted me to be, but this is an enormously complex issue. And we always said before the liberation of Mosul, if we don't get the political outcome right, then immediately after the liberation of Mosul, the shooting will start between the Kurds and the Arab tribes and the Iraqi army and the Hashtashabi. And daggone if it didn't. Um, and there's another couple of reasons here. Um, the Iraqi army was missing in action at the beginning of this war. We, one half of the Iraqi army was unaccounted for after the invasion of ISIL. When we went in to do the inventory to see what was left of the Iraqi army, about half of them was unaccounted for. Four divisions collapsed in front of ISIL in the north. What that meant was the Peshmerga, the great fighters, 
of the, of the KRG. The Peshmerga had to do a disproportionate amount of fight, fighting in Arab territory, and frankly, a disproportionate amount of bleeding and dying. And what Masoud Barzani said was, we're not given back an inch of the ground that we bled for that was Arab territory. Because, in his mind and others, that ground had been given up by people sympathetic to Daesh. That's probably not true, but in any case, Peshmerga bled a lot for ground that, for example, the Yazidi areas, Sinjar, and so on. So the idea that after paying such a great price by the Kurds to take this ground, and the Kurds, remember, had a million refugees in Kurdistan that they were taking who were Arabs. They weren't Kurds, they were Arabs. Their sense was their right to that ground in the aftermath of the fighting. And, and the central government and Baghdad's sense was, no, you've got to give it back. You've got to move back within the green line, if you will. And this is the source of tension. And it's not resolved yet. And some of the last forces that the Americans had there in 2011 were American combat forces sitting between the Arab forces in the northern part of Iraq and the Peshmerga in the southern part of the KRG, because that area was a flashpoint. Now that flashpoint's beginning to light up a little bit, and we're obviously very concerned about it. So I, I've sort of admired the problem with you, but I've given you no solutions. Uh, our, our, in, our, intent, our intent, obviously, is to keep Iraq together, to try to convince Masoud Barzani, please don't implement the, re the referendum for uh, independence right now. This is, this is just not the time. Let's try to figure out what's happening in Syria. Let's consolidate Iraq back within its sovereign borders. Let's see if we can, by peaceful negotiations, adjust the KRG's land. Let's get the Hashtashabi out of the north where they don't have any business being except in the context of, of war fighting against Stash. Let's see if we can go back to a position where reconciliation can begin to occur. But there's been a lot of bleeding and dying and some really, really awful circumstances in Iraq as a direct result of the Islamic State's presence, and the blood is still high there. With regard to hyperwar, um, you know, the technologically advanced countries that have the capacity uh, to begin the process of the militarization of artificial intelligence, I think, are going to do it. it. It doesn't make sense not to. We're, we're in a bit of a debate within the U.S. about whether we'll ever produce fully autonomous killing systems. Um, look, a lot of civilians get killed in combat, and every time it's awful. And I, I would, as a commander who had forces that sadly uh, resulted in the death of civilians, it was the worst experience I had in combat. Uh, there, you know, the, the fighting was something that came naturally, it was the killing of civilians that was the awful part of it. I would propose that while we feel a, a sense of concern over autonomous killing systems, we may well find with the right kinds of algorithms, algorithms that have been geared to be in compliance with the law of armed conflict, we may find that the precise engagement of targets with the kinds of target identification that is computer supported may in fact create far less civilian casualties and less collateral damage than otherwise with a 2,000 pound bomb, which is a bit more difficult to control. So we need to be careful about the debate there are some who say artificial intelligence will call, cause World War III. Vladimir Putin, at the opening day of school in Russia this year, this year, just last month, said the nation that controls artificial intelligence will rule the world. The Chinese have invested $150 billion in it. You know, we all need to be thinking in a clear-minded, clear-eyed way about where artificial intelligence can go. Let's get it going on behalf of humankind. If we've got to weaponize it, let's make sure the algorithms are consistent with who we are as free people in democracies for, hum for whom human rights are important. That's possible to do. I, I know it is. So I'll stop there. Uh, one, OK. Let's start with you, sir. If you could. Uh, somebody. There's, there's a mic coming to you. One second. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, back there. Start there. Uh, I am Ajay Jonkar. I am a senior fellow in Center for Land Warfare Studies in New Delhi. Uh, I was just visualizing the map of the world when you were putting through, Dhruv was putting both of the gentlemen through the questions. Uh, 
in the initial part you were there in continental europe both mr talbot and general allen and you were concentrating on the heartland because it is important to you then he brought you down from there to the middle east and in the middle east you established the connection that is coming through the divide that is going through shia sunni divide the russian and the persian influence but he was trying to get you to indo pacific and you never crossed the digo garcia line i i just was visualizing that so my question is that here too in this region it is very important that you understand the continental and the heartland dynamics that are going through i i don't know whether both you gentlemen were being very geopolitically correct and not just talking about china at all in this part of the region in the heartland a lot of activity is going on and the divide which is actually there one side between the persian and the russian connection and the chinese coming through the belt road is uh, initiatives right through putting all the eggs in the one basket in the cpec and also coming to the southeast asian regions are you doing enough as a nation and is nato doing enough as a conglomerate to try and avoid what is going to end what's going to happen in the next 10 to 15 years please Us and, and, and its allies, what are they doing in the Asia Pacific? Absolutely, and especially considering the heartland in this area. Okay, all right. Okay, uh, just take a few more questions. Uh, let's start here. Uh, uh, Admiral Koshin. Thank you. I'm uh, Pradeep Koshin, retired Vice Admiral from Indian Navy. Uh, he has just uh, put the question to Indian uh, Indo-Pacific region. I was going to comment on that, that uh, rebalance, et cetera, that we had seen for some time, not much is being spoken of, even as uh, China has come about and started, moved into Djibouti and gone towards Gwadar and establishing the presence there. Uh, how do you see the thing panning out in the near future? Because it was just six, seven years, seven, eight years ago uh, that two of your allies actually got into problem with Chinese, uh, the South Koreans and the Japanese, and other than lip service, there wasn't anything done. But five years ago, Philippines were in problem with them. Other than lip service, there wasn't anything done. And now the U.S. is inviting people to come along and carry greater weight. Now, that is fair enough for regional people to do. Uh, but with Djibouti and uh, Gwadar being under Chinese control increasingly, what was discussed in, uh, in, uh, 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 in U.S. about uh, five years ago of uh, NATO having a role to play in Indian Ocean. Is that what you're looking at seriously? Thank you. Uh, I'm retired Major General uh, P.K. Malik. So my question is to General Allen. Uh, taking off from what Mr. Joshi had asked, you know, there is a disconnect where India's Western concerns are not being seen. Is there a point of shifting the inter-formation boundaries? The, the, the India-Pakistan border is the border between Pacific Command and the Central Command. Is there a point if the border shifts to the for the right or to the right of India so that India gets because Pacific is too far as far as we are concerned? Uh, will the situation improve? Just a recommendation. Second is, you know, Robert Gates when he was Defense Secretary, he made a point in U.S. military academy while he addressing that one thing is consistent in U.S. armed forces is they have been failing to anticipate the next war. They have always been preparing for the war, which now. You see uh, General Millet, or who is the present CSA, he's saying that US armed forces are fighting in various places, but they are not, you know, the US has not fought any war where for a long time uh, enemy air action was there. The EW has been a failure very badly in Syria and other places in Ukraine. They're telling the armed forces, the army especially, that you please get into conventional mode. The Win TT, the technical, uh, their tactical network is six billion dollar project. Is put it into dustbin. So do you find any uh, any conflict that one the conventional as well as the hybrid or unconventional warfare they're talking? Is there a conflict for which the U.S. Army should be or U.S. armed forces should be training? We're running short of time. And the three people, we're running short of time, the three people with their hands up. If we could take three quick questions and then lump them in yeah, together. I'm writing them down. So, so uh, Sophia and then. These are pretty. Yeah. 
<coughs> General Helen, you very succinctly brought out after the Ottoman Empire several issues until the Arab Spring. However, the question of external intervention, especially in Libya and then following Syria, was not touched upon. Now, I have been ambassador to Libya before, uh, after Gaddafi immediately. So I want to just uh, ask you how much this external intervention, which did not have a clear roadmap, uh, responsible for the disaster that has followed. Secondly, do you think there is any model uh, intervention mechanism apart from military intervention that is being thought of? Uh, my question is uh, basically in relation to the role of Israel between the India-US relationship. Thank you. I had to, uh, uh, I want to ask you a question about uh, the uh, hybrid threat that you spoke about. Is one of the problem that we're also seeing in the region is that the lines between sub and conventional warfare have blurred and blurred in a way that. The lines between what, I'm sorry? Sub conventional warfare and sub conventional, or call it irregular, irregular warfare and conventional warfare have blurred. We're emphasizing a lot on the non-state actor, which is Daesh or Lashkar-e Taiba, you know, uh, other is, uh, Islamic uh, uh, radical organizations. But really, the problem that we are seeing both in the Indo-Pacific, the South China Sea, as well in in West Asia, is that state actors are sometimes using non-state actors as proxies. Is that a problem that we are going to increasingly face in the future, wherein you're fighting non-state actors, but actually you're fighting a state? that is hiding behind the garb of these non-state actors? And do we have a plan to tackle that kind of a problem? Hi. Um, my question is for General Allen as well. And, <laughs> and it's actually not about geo sort of global geostrategic um, politics, but about um, well, strategy within Brookings. And as the new Brookings president, what public policy issues do you see, I mean, other ones that you want to focus on in the next five years or so, both domestically as well as abroad? That one you can take offline, perhaps. But, uh, you know, we, we, if just take the other questions. I'll talk with you. Yeah, yeah. Just take the other questions. Um, the, just to summarize, a question about the continental versus the heartland. I mean, this is Mackinder versus Mahan in some ways. Uh, in the Asia Pacific, we kind of touched upon it in the European and the Middle Eastern context. Two, um, what's happened to the rebalance, and particularly in the context, I mean, Gwadar and Djibouti both fell within CENTCOM's domain. What do you make of China, Chinese inroads there? Uh, is the US military always prepared to fight the last war? And uh, that, that was another question. Libya, was there a, uh, uh, what, what was the, um, uh, was there any thought, was, was, Lib was it poorly thought through, the, the Libyan intervention? Uh, I, I, if you have time, touch upon Israel and, and subconventional warfare, although I think he addressed some of that earlier. So perhaps if you could just stick to maybe the, the Libya bit, military preparedness, uh, and the rebalance. And, and well, I, as, I have, uh, as I've listened broadly to the service chiefs talking, um, their sense is that they have to fight across a far greater spectrum of conflict than they ever did before. Uh, so I... I'll just give you an example in the Marine Corps. We have a three-star general now responsible for what we call information. But that's in the context of the full spectrum of war and how information plays in the spectrum of war. As a commander in Afghanistan, where I had the chance to run information and influence and cyber operations in conjunction with conventional operations, I saw them as a part of a whole. And information and influence and cyber operations set the conditions for my conventional forces to have context and also to be successful. Or sometimes my conventional forces would con or my special operations forces would conduct operations that would drive the enemy to begin to talk. And once he began to talk or I was able to detect cyber activity, I could then do the targeting necessary. It, it is a full spectrum. You can't consider I'm going to do a little hybrid and a little bit of cyber. You have to, it's what I would consider the grand combined arms from hybrid on the one end, which is influencing people through intrusion into social media and positing opinions in social media that you have 
targeted against a particular population that is susceptible to it on the one end, all the way up through the high end of conventional firepower and maneuver operations. But commanders and states and militaries have to see this as a continuum and have to be prepared to operate across that full continuum with the right kinds of capabilities in a slipping scale or a sliding scale <clears throat> in order for you to be able to achieve decisive effect at the point in time that you want to and the point on the ground that you want to. If you only get ready for high-end conventional maneuver warfare, you have probably taken, in many respects, as we get deeper into the capacity for hostile states to use artificial intelligence to harvest enormous amounts of information about you and your family and your people, and then to target influence operations against you directly as a people. If we have taken that off the table in terms of the uh, capacity of the military to operate at that level of hybrid warfare, then we have handed the enemy, I think, decisive capacity against populations. For example, how they'll vote and for whom they'll vote and whether they have confidence in the institutions of government. You don't have to fire a shot to cause a people to be politically confused and have no confidence in their government anymore and then take them off the map because they'll leave an institution like the EU or they'll leave an institution like NATO. And then you've accomplished what Sun Tzu has always wanted, which is the greatest generals win without having to conduct military operations. So it is a combined arms spectrum of capabilities that we have to master from the one end to the other. And they're all related to each other. Um, the United States has five go to war defensive treaties or military treaties in East Asia. East Asia is extraordinarily important to the United States. We consider ourselves a Pacific nation. And in that context, we have bilateral defense uh, arrangements with uh, South Korea and Japan and Thailand and the Philippines and, and Australia. And we adhere to those. But we've got to be very careful about the trigger that sends us to war with China. Uh, you know, there's four C's that we often think about in terms of the relationship with China. <coughs> One is find ways to cooperate, but expect that we're going to compete. The third is manage the potential for confrontation, and above all, seek not to engage in conflict. Because I, I think that India would not want to see the United States go to war with China in East Asia for a whole variety of reasons, which is why, in many respects, China is the most consequential single relationship we have. Although I personally believe, in the years to come, the indispensable relationship for the United States will be India not as a counterbalance to China, but as a grand strategic partner in so many ways as two large, prosperous democracies. But in the meantime, the rise of China, it is consequential. And our economic relationships are, are inextricably linked. And when I talk to my Asian friends, their view isn't that they ever want to be given a choice about whether it should be China or the United States. What they want to is exist in an environment where it is China and the United States. The question then becomes, how do we deal with policies that might look like predatory economics and that sort of thing? And uh, we're not there yet in the United States. We haven't figured this out. When you start off uh, a, a presidential administration by throwing TPP out the window, which, was, which had enormous capacity ultimately to unite vibrant uh, economies uh, ultimately to the benefit of all of, the, all of those states and all of those people, and the first thing we do is to throw out TPP, then pretty quickly your options are both limited and your credibility is questioned. And that's, that's where we find ourselves today. I'm not sure I'm getting to anybody's one Lib question. Li Libya. Libya, well, I said it before. I mean, we, we, the United States frankly helped out at the beginning, but Libya was prosecuted, as you know, primarily by uh, others uh, within NATO and the firepower phase we got okay but the phase four phase which is what we do to stabilize in the aftermath was a failure and as a direct result of that Libya which was always really three Cyrenaica, Cyrenaica Tripolitania and uh, Fezzan uh, those three areas are now largely fragmented from each other and there's no real uh, gravitational force pulling them together. The question will be, and we've got a, a scholar at Brookings that's writing on this a lot, 
uh, are we willing to accept a, a relatively weak central government and see those three areas, which, you know, as far back as the Romans, those three areas operated that way. And it was only under the, the uh, despotism of uh, Gaddafi they really ever came together and looked like a full nation. Otherwise, those three areas have largely always been separate for a whole variety of reasons. How we accept, if we believe we're going to see a unified Libya again in the near future, we need to check our prescriptions. But the truth is, there is the potential that we could have some form of a federal government and a, and a loose, semi-autonomous series of provinces, and I think that's the best we're going to do in the short term. And we shouldn't be surprised at that because for most of history, it's been that way. The question then becomes how do we relate to those states and how do we relate to a weak central government uh, in the long term? But the phase four piece of it was a failure. Thank you very much. It leaves it to me to uh, wrap up. But before uh, people uh, get up to go, I do, do want to end on a, a certain note. Uh, one uh, is to welcome again uh, John Allen as a uh, new president of Brookings. And I think one of the nice things is in this capacity, he should hopefully be visiting here every six months, every, uh, every year at least. Uh, and so I'm sure you'll all have more opportunities to hear from him uh, and to uh, benefit from his incredible insight and wisdom and experience on, on, on several issues. Um, and also, uh, it leaves me uh, to thank uh, Stro Talbot. Uh, this uh, Brookings India has really been, in many ways, a labor of love. Uh, on the part of many people, but one of them, and really a per person who's, uh, for, uh, who is really indis indispensable in the creation of Brookings India, uh, was Strobe Talbot, and I think this will always be a part of his uh, legacy as the president of Brookings. Uh, so if you could all join me in thanking both our speakers, but especially also Strobe Talbot. Uh, <laughs>